Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to the video version of the Realignment Podcast. Sagar and I spoke with Ben Smith about his new book, Traffic. It's all about how the digital media space, everything from the Huffington Post to Gawker to BuzzFeed device, really crashed and burned off the back of Facebook and all those other 2010s events that really shaped everything we consume when it comes to the news. The book's timing couldn't be better, especially given all the bankruptcies and shutdowns that have been happening lately. So hope you all enjoy this conversation. Let me know what you think in the comments. Ben Smith, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to see you, man. Yeah. Good to really... see you. Congrats on your independent new media venture. I wrote oh, about you when you were still you did. working for big media. You were the uh, you were one of the original media. people. Yeah, let's not yeah. be overly uh, generous. Let's, let's not be too there generous. With, uh, to big media. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of big media, let's let's kick off here. So, just read the book. Really enjoyed it. I have to say though, it's hard to find a note of optimism coming from this, in the sense that looking at the media landscape right now, like BuzzFeed, is it doing too hot? The whole creator economy thing is kind of cratering in its own way. Um, you've got a lot of uh, pessimism on the newsletter front with platforms like Substack. If you're looking at the digital media space today, is there anything that excites you? Is there anything where you're like, oh man, if I were 23 years old, this is the trend or the feature in the environment I would lean into? Yeah. I mean, I just started a new media company some before. So obviously I have some remnant, either optimism or delusion. I guess that's the, that's the word in the subtitle of the book mm -hmm. I just wrote. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the thing about these moments is that in these moments of dramatic change in what basically in what consumers want, right? It's not, this isn't technical. It's about what people want. There's a lot of opportunity to do something new. I think in the sort of early digital media years, which I just sort of spent all this time thinking and writing about, what it was was that there was this like small number of media outlets that had, among other things, really massively failed the country in the Iraq war and, had, and, and, both, and were technically wildly out of sync with digital media and the way people were living and then substantively had just gotten the biggest story in the world wrong. And so there was this real hunger for alternate outside challenging voices. I think now... People are like, wow, it's fun to have all those voices screaming at me in my head all the time, but I don't know which is which, and I don't know who to trust, and there's too many of them. And and, and can someone please give me a, like, a, you know, something that feels more synthesized and authoritative and still, I think, personal in a way that didn't used to be true? You know, people want to hear more from an individual than they want to hear from kind of a faceless institution. I think in some ways, the, you know, the podcasts like this are one of the answers to that, and that's why audio has become so popular, is it gives a kind of synthesis, a clear telling of the story rather than the kind of chaos of social media. I think newsletters, which we're doing a lot of, is is, is this another sort of answer to the same problem. I think what people want is a little different from what it used to be. It changes. And so that does make it an interesting moment to do something new. Hmm. So reading the book, though, Ben, the question of what do people actually want becomes interesting because so much of 2010's media is a debate over what people actually want. Um, but this story kind of turns on Mark Zuckerberg saying, actually, people people want news. They want a news feed. Actually, people want friends and family. And then a couple of media companies crash there. So how like writing this book and telling this story and living it, do you think about the question of what do people actually want? Because the answer seems to me kind of unclear from my perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think there is this interplay of, right, actual consumer preferences. And then particularly in this world where there's like one platform, Facebook, it's making decisions that are basically like, ultimately, their goal is to get more people to stick to Facebook. What they are mostly trying to do is give people what they want and have them spend more time on Facebook and click on more ads. It's easy for people in the media and politics to imagine that they're basically sitting around thinking, like, how do we screw the right wing media and how do we promote Donald Trump or the vice versa or whatever. But mostly they're thinking, how do we raise the number of minutes the consumer is spending on our platform from 3.3 to 3.4? Um, and But what that means is they make these decisions, these technical product decisions that can cascade through society, particularly again, when we're living in a world where it's basically one platform everybody's on and one guy is making decisions about it. Um, and I think, I guess the part of, you know, there was this period twenty after 2016 where Facebook was under all this public political pressure to get away from essentially right-wing populism dominating the platform mm -hmm. and simultaneously, you know, wanted to keep growing and tried to, and, and, and there was a thing that they were hearing that, 
you know, the like kind of toxic drive by politics and stupid stories that people didn't really read, but shared about Hillary Clinton secretly having been replaced by a body double. We're kind of going everywhere. And they would, what they would do is they would tweak the algorithm. So the thing that they really favored were meaningful social interactions. And they thought that meant you really read the article, you were passionate about it, you shared it. What it actually meant when they implemented it was that like, I posted a meme of like Bernie Sanders you commented, kill yourself 17 times yeah, in a row. Right. Yeah. And then they were like, wow, look at all this engagement and <laughs> showed it to everybody. Yeah, it turned out engagement was mostly like hateful and toxic and honestly might have been worse. I had something you mentioned and you spent some time on, which I actually find inspiring, relating also kind of uh, my own journey in media is what were the problems that new media in the mid 2000s and the 2010s we're solving for. You mentioned there the Iraq war. I'm thinking to the blogger era, which eventually coalesces inside of BuzzFeed in terms of Gawker, in terms of we're being real, we're going to give it to you raw. What was that landscape like, Ben, for some of our viewers were literally not even alive on 9-11, so they don't even know what we're yeah. talking about. Judith Miller, um, who's she, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't I don't even think they might know who Possibly Judith some of is. our <laughs> some of our co-hosts were not yeah. old then. Um, I don't know. Right. I'm not no, going to we, 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 we were alive. We were, uh, we were, you, we were in Barcelona like, we were in 30 30 30 so yeah. straining it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we were young. You were yeah. children. Is yeah. that the word we're going for? <laughs> um, I mean, I was basically a child. Yeah. The, um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing that was so exciting, and it is sort of interesting to put your head back in that place, was just how wide open it was, that the media had been controlled by the people who controlled the printing presses and the broadcast towers, who felt, I mean, not wrongly, a lot of responsibility to limit what would go out. You're not going to throw everything out, but also did mean that it really narrowed the conversation. There was an alt, you know, there's the alternative media. There were alt weeklies and things like that and early chat rooms and blogs. But that as that really accelerated, it, it kind of just, you know, opened up this whole new inability to challenge that media where it was just manifestly wrong, right? Or where you thought it was. And then to report facts. I wonder if it's just at the speed at which people were really living. I mean, yes. it's interesting. When I, when I went back to that era, the thing that kind of struck me, because there were a lot of famous blogs and moments and sort of forgotten lore. But the one where I thought, wow, this was a sort of preview of what was to come was this site called Jezebel, which yes. like you were probably not reading both because you were a child and because I know you were a it, guy. But uh... <laughs> As I was not reading because I was a guy. It was a women, <laughs> sort of women's women's blog that it's launched in 07. And these women who like had been living inside, the, working for Glamour and places like that and writing just the dumbest stuff that had no connection to any real person's life um, and hated it started this blog where the first thing they did was they offered a $10,000 bounty to whoever could find an unretouched image of a model that had then run <laughs> in a magazine. And sure enough, somebody turns up with a unphotoshopped version of Faith Hill that had run in Red Book. And they kind of deconstructed how they had gotten rid of her freckles and gotten rid of her smile lines. And like, it feels like a small thing, but it was actually like, if you think about how photoshopping and the sort of way women's body images were like, it was a big deal, actually. Oh, yeah. And, and in general, they sort of and it was sort of parallel to all the other bullshit in media, but they kind of opened, they also like pointed, just, just started publishing a list of how many black models were in each issue of every magazine. It was usually zero. And you know what? The magazine editors were ashamed about it and changed it. And it was this like early instance of like, wow, like this kind of mm -hmm. media, which would evolve into social media and is kind of organized around identity can be incredibly powerful, constructive, I would say, like positive, frank and honest in the way they talk to each other. But also, almost immediately, they developed this pretty pathological relationship with their commenters, who were so dialed in, so passionate, felt so connected to the authors. When the authors strayed from the orthodoxy, they would face this fury that was totally unlike anything you had seen before mm -hmm. in legacy media, and really kind of like put enormous kind of emotional pressure on them and drove them nuts. And by within a year, the whole thing kind of melts down. And it did, just writing about it and talking to the people doing it, it was like, you the you really saw the whole cycle of the 2010s kind of play out in advance and everything that felt positive and everything that felt really toxic. That's interesting. That's interesting. You know, uh, reading the book, I think you do a good job of conveying that it's easy for us to Monday morning quarterback um, on a couple of different levels. Um, but there's a sentence where you describe kind of Jonah Peretti, you know, founder of BuzzFeed, co-founder of uh, HuffPost, his kind of pitch, which is, hey, in the 80s, you had cable come out, and there were a variety of channels, Viacom, via MTV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that then provide content for cable providers, and now they have these big companies. So we could say to ourselves, 
wow, it was so crazy that like BuzzFeed and the Dodo and now this, that they built their businesses on top of social media, but actually that's an entirely legitimate and understandable pitch to make. So the question for you is, what went wrong? Because when you say it the way you wrote the sentence, I'm like, oh yeah, like that could have just happened. Like BuzzFeed and Facebook could have grown together and everyone's rich and everyone's kind of happy. Like what actually stops that story from turning into the disaster where media companies like The Bustle, Mike, et cetera, are kind of nuked because they put their stuff on Facebook or depend yeah. on Facebook for their content? Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, I think that's the core business bet that all these companies got wrong. And I guess, you know, you can argue about was it knowable in advance that it wasn't going to play out that way? Like, I think that there's a scenario, the one that I think in some ways Jonah and others anticipated and we anticipated that, you know, as these platforms compete with one another and make, there's going to, they're, they're going to like the way cable networks might compete with one another or direct TV mm -hmm. competes with, um, Comcast, they got to have good content and they have to pay for it and they have to realize that they need to create an ecosystem where quality content creators are compensated for the work. And I think, but they, but there was this new thing, user generated content and it was free. And they liked that. And that and the profit margins on free are a lot better than the profit margins on splitting revenue with media companies. And 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 there and the other stream of it was this idea of creators, a word essentially created by the platforms to prevent, you know, any kind of organization among the atomized individuals they deal with. Like Uber would rather deal with drivers than fleets, mm -hmm. and YouTube would rather deal with creators than media companies or other kinds of cartels that could jam them up. Um, and so I do think there was this underlying kind of economic choices made by the platforms. And I think as you watch Facebook to my mind, unravel right now, you can say like, huh, like maybe they did need to move further up market to have higher quality content. Maybe that was the real, a, a smarter direction of travel for them than re relying forever on UGC. You know, they made like Netflix is in a pretty strong place, I think. I mean, sure. having its problems, but ultimately, you know, Facebook made some sporadic gestures to try to compete with Netflix, but never nailed it. And you know, there is obviously a lot of consumption of high quality, professionally created content and the social networks for various reasons, economic, ideological, never got into that business. Well, quick thing. I mean, yeah. there were Facebook originals for a bit. So like my inner Facebook exec is like, wait a second, we did do that. Remember, it didn't remember they, work. they brought the, what was yeah. it? They brought the real world. They There was the real world on Facebook for a hot yep. second. What went yep. wrong and there? It, and, it, and it didn't, you know, it didn't, they weren't, I mean, part of the problem is like, they weren't that good at it. These creative industries uh, are tough know. and you need hits. And the people at HBO are the best at making hits and it's not for, and there's something about the DNA of these tech companies that makes them bad at it. And that's a cultural, that's very, it's not a soluble problem. And maybe none of this stuff was soluble, but I think there was a world, there's an alternate universe where Facebook chooses to compete by leaning into professional content, but they never, maybe it wouldn't have worked either. I, I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm not particularly smug yeah. about this. That's the ultimate question because the same thing happened with Apple TV. It's like you know, money can't just buy you great content, you know. And as you said, well, you do need. But I actually, but Apple TV is a great example. Like okay. it's now it's working. Why is it working? Because they bought Ted Lasso. Why did they do that? I don't know. Somebody had good taste. That's like, right. It's 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 hard, a little hard to predict. So they had Ted Lasso and then uh, the morning show, but they also had like ten other shows. I believe they had to cancel. Yeah. I believe it cost like several. Hundred. Yeah, but I mean, it's fine that, for them. You know. Yeah, and that's yeah. the studio. Yeah, that that's the studio business, right? Yes. Like it's a weird right. business where you have hits and you have misses. It's totally unlike yeah. the business of sort of building a platform by learning and learning and testing and learning and making these microscopic adjustments until you get somewhere better. It's like this, these cultural businesses are totally different where it's like you make point. movies and you have brilliant people, you have to pay a lot of money and behave very strangely and you put up with them. I mean, it's a different. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's a very important point about why uh, there's kind of a mismatch. Actually, we were curious, why did you choose uh, BuzzFeed and Gawker and not some of the other, BuzzFeed, I'm assuming just because you had the insight, but like a Vox or Vice, Vice Bustle, yeah. so many of the other, actually Vice given the basically safe facing the same constraints. And also, I mean, when I was a teenager, Vice is Shane Smith's like Vice Guide to North Korea is what inspired me to get into the business, which is kind of, that's kind yeah. of sad uh, to see how it ended up. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious the choices for the book, you know, not BuzzFeed aside, just because your own personal Well, no, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think, you yeah. know, if you're ever, if you're telling a story, you're always going to choose 
your own way in and it's, mm-hmm. it's always going to be a little arbitrary. I mean, I, I chose Jonah and Nick and as the sort of main characters. HuffPost is in there too early a lot because they were these two people who in the early aughts thought they saw the future, had very, very different visions of it, were very bitter personal rivals at one point. And, you know, and, and I think it, that the, the sort of Jonah had this very optimistic idea that social media, as he was very early to see, would change the way people communicate and change what they communicated. He thought that would be almost entirely positive, that people interacting in public would not do screamy negative politics. They would do inspiring positive things because who wants to look like a jerk who's yelling at people? It turns out many people. <laughs> um, and Nick had this totally different idea that that this kind of digital media would sort of rip the hypocrisy off of journalism and of content and would allow you just to give people the pornography they wanted without all the nonsense and dressing of of other um you know of um and hypocrisy of old media mm-hmm. and these were these two very different paths and philosophies and i think I, that so i sort of in, in people and, and chose to follow it through that way i mean i think there are many i think vox that is really interesting and was a much less ideological much more business driven place that and quick thing strong. we mean like vox media vox so like there's media. vox the publication yeah. but you like vox media is like the bigger Which includes the verge and bleacher report and exactly. a bunch of other things that you know the jim bank office you know, kind of snapped together and in in a way that was less ideological and holds up better. Um, Vice is totally interesting and different in that it was never totally on the internet. Compared to these other sites, it was just ah, a tiny, tiny, tiny true. fraction of their traffic, but had an incredible brand, sold a television show, made tons of money, but spent more. Yeah. And another great, great point. Qu- another question that um, comes to mind here, you're bringing up Jim Bankoff. So much of this story comes down to people who like really cut their teeth in like the failure of the AOL Time Warner deal. Just so many, just name after name after name after name um, in that post.com bubble era. Looking at the 2010s, um, if we could compare the failures of big, ambitious companies of talented people to that failure of AOL Time Warner, where there's a bunch of talented people who go outwards, do you think there are any hints at, wow, like maybe BuzzFeed didn't work, but it turns out that like these 10 to 15 people who worked in this space are going to be really defining characters in the late 2020s. Um, the, let's see, you know, Other it's really you, interesting course. to say that because I think one <laughs> of, I would say a couple of things. One is just that, yeah, the New York Times in Purdue, which is the premier journalistic institution in the country, absorbed a ton of the talent and the DNA and the way of thinking about journalism from the internet. And by the way, you know, 2020, like I'm working there, Kara Swisher is working there, Corey Sika is working there, Dodai Stewart is working there, a lot of the people- Ezra goes had, there. Ezra, Ezra Klein, yeah. of course, yeah, who had sort of figured this stuff out. And by the way, had figured it out in totally different ways, had, were many very critical of the New York Times, critical of each other, had totally different philosophies of how to do journalism, are all working together for the New York Times with all these New York Times people who are kind of skeptical of us. And so- one of the reasons that I think the New York Times lost its mind and is having these kind of rolling civil wars, which seem to be subsiding, is that they kind of swallowed the whole internet and the whole internet is just a bunch <laughs> of crazy people who hate each other. And That's suddenly right. they all work for the New York Times and are fighting inside the tent. Taylor um, and Ted Barry Weiss I, in the same publication yeah, right, for a hot Taylor, second. Taylor worked there, but right, exactly. Yeah. Like everyone worked there. The, but I think, Marshall, like the thing you said before, I think so, I hadn't really thought about it, but people coming out of the AOL Time Warner merger, by the way, the AOL people made off like bandits. One of the lessons of it was sell your company. Um, <laughs> yeah. And Ken Lear, the chairman of BuzzFeed, had been at AOL. Um, and, but I do think partly because that merger was perceived as a disaster, people like Jonah, Shane Smith, were very reluctant to sell their companies. And Ken Lear was like, I mean, continues to this day, I think, to think we were total morons to not sell the company to Disney for $650 million in 2014. I think any normal business analysis of shareholder value would in fact confirm that we were total morons. Mm -hmm. But I do think that like the shadow of those, you know, we cared a lot about the work and didn't think it would, the merger would wind up produce, you know, like we would, it would sort of all fizzle if we sold and, and, and we're looking certainly at it, like at things like AOL Time Warner, just to see how, like what bad mismatches these had been. I totally understand. Uh, and, you know, in that context about why wouldn't I, look, it, it's always nobody ever knows whether they're making the right decision or not. I'm curious about the news business starting it for BuzzFeed. One of the things you wrote about was about how BuzzFeed news brought legitimacy kind of to the advertising business. Do you still think that that's true? Like, or is that no longer true? in terms of news as a whole around legitimacy and advertising as a market itself? Well, I think, you know, brand, media, brands do matter in yes. media. Um, 
And I think, you know, you and I are both starting new brands and it's mm -hmm. quite hard. And how, how people perceive your brand matters a lot. If you're in a advertising business, how people perceive your brand matters a lot. And for BuzzFeed in that moment, there was a bunch of, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a bunch of websites that were just like great at generating like weird nonsense that got traffic and BuzzFeed was one of them. Nine gag was the oh, biggest yeah. actually, if anybody remembers all over that. Nine gag. It was massive. Yeah, and um, and uh, break.com yeah. was one. And none of those others exist because they were really perceived as spam and garbage and advertisers didn't want anything to do with them. Also the platforms didn't want anything to do with them. And I think doing news sort of vaulted BuzzFeed out of that category in a way that was really important and sort of generated this kind of cultural relevance that made us really hot for a while and was really valuable and commercially valuable and had a, and for a little while it was like, oh, this totally makes sense. Like news is doing this useful service to the brand. The we're, Our revenues are growing like crazy and a bit of it's going to subsidize news. That kind of may all makes commercial sense. I mean, that pretty, that did that ran out of time. I guess something I want to ask you then is the way you're telling this history really starting, you know, late nineties and moving onwards as you go from a world where, um, Jonah is going viral because people forward, um, his emails. And then you have people who are mastering search and then you're really centering down to social mastering the social media algorithm for a hot second, or at least claiming that you have, um, sitting in 2023, how does content get shared? Today and because also the thing too is that like this is why Elon's in a bit of a scuffle with publishers. Twitter, right, despite being the water cooler, is not actually where most publishers get most of their content. So like if you were to say in 2023, like how does someone share or go viral or does even going viral does it even matter now? I think it's I think I mean I think that world has shrunk a lot. Like these platforms are smaller and less relevant. Um, the web, the like World Wide Web, is much less is smaller and less relevant than it used to be. The um, I was talking to one of my kids actually and was trying to explain a website. I was saying if you see something on Business Insider, what's Business Insider? I was like, oh, it's it's a news website. And they said, oh, you mean in Safari? Huh. I was like, right, it's a feature of this app called Safari that's one of a number of apps on your phone. You know, I mean, and, and meanwhile, TikTok, I mean, TikTok is the biggest right now yes. winner, but, you know, these in short video probably remain, whether TikTok or not, is an important part of the landscape for a while. It's not that social. Like some people post, but a lot more lean back and consume. Um, so, no, I think that, I think the world has changed a lot. And I think, I think probably for better people are much more siloed or getting news much more from people they trust in a in a sort of more closed environment whether it's the new york times paywall or i hope our newsletter products and less from stuff bouncing around social media but wait to yeah. bring back a you know filter bubble the negative way of saying what you just said is that we're all hanging out in yeah. our like little filter bubbles. So like, what, what's your, what's your kind of, cause that was a very, cause, cause to, to your point around, you know, Jonah and the optimism, like this was supposed to be the answer to filter yeah. bubbles, but we ended up there. Like, what's your response to that? Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, social media on one hand, it was sort of a, it's sort of a filter bubble, but on the other hand, you're really like the main thing it does now is show you what your enemies think, mm -hmm. but Are also like page? whoever <laughs> among you, wh whichever of your people, whichever, like the dumbest expression, of your enemies is the thing that it's absolutely the best at bringing to your attention, um, which is a funny kind. It is sort of a filter bubble, but it's it's like a funny funhouse mirror type of one. No, I mean I think the you know like the normal history of media is you mostly hear from people you like and trust, not people you hate and despise and distrust, <laughs> and seems not terrible that that's how people would consume it doesn't seem like the experiment with having everyone in the world standing in the same giant public square screaming at the top of their lungs was like hugely constructive i mean i do think for people like you who want who who believe, who wanted to really tear down institutions like the and and, and me too in, in the world of media mm -hmm. like it actually did that and we succeeded and yeah. did an enormous amount of damage to institutions that in many ways were pretty sclerotic and corrupt and messed up i would say in media at least i underestimated the value of having some kind of trusted institution and that we're now in a moment where rebuilding that is pretty important. I think that's fair. Yeah. It's interesting too. Well, here's a, here's not a to great go for, question. Not to attack you personally or say, no, no, I mean, you can, Marshall, I'm less familiar with welcome your politics. To. Uh, he's more institutionalist. He's like you. Despite uh, our outfits. So, uh, if you're watching on yeah. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're such a, uh, yeah. so deceptive. He's an role. Austin tech bro. Yeah, it is yeah. what it is. Uh, 
Ben, I'm curious here around you. Obviously, your first column at the Times was just all about the success of the New York Times and whether that was good for media. We're thinking of a book passage uh, where Jonah Peretti was telling the uh, New York Times executives, he's like, I would go. What did he say? He's like, I'd go and close my door and cry. If um, he was and, given the keys right. to the yeah, castle. They, yeah, they, right. They asked him what he would do if he was CEO of the New right. York Times. And this is in the peak BuzzFeed right. arrogance, <laughs> Times panic. And he said he would... First, he would ask for a raise, and second, he would go into his office and cry. <laughs> right. Well, it's like, well, it turns out he probably should have been the one crying. So uh, whenever we think about how the New York Times, like you said, just successfully absorbed the internet, why, though, did they, of all of the brands, succeed? I always think about the Washington Post here, where the so narrative- they, Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, specifically, they beat the Washington Post yes. because the Washington Post was owned by a billionaire and did not have the same kind of existential panic that the Salzberger family did. And they were forced to just sort of like stare death in the face and 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 dealt really well. What they did, it's interesting. You know, there's this idea in tech that it's there's a strategy called fast following that you sort of, you know, you're watching your competitors and you move very fast to do right. what is ever succeeding better. Times didn't do that. They followed slowly. They watched what was working. They didn't, the post was always skipping from trend to trend. The times was slow but was very, very deliberate and thoughtful and, you know, and stuck to what its strength, didn't try to become something it wasn't, but stuck to its strength. And it's kind of funny. If you look at the successful New York Times business now, you see something that you can kind of squint and see the great New York Times print business of the 90s with a cooking section and crosswords, crosswords. and sports and a great news front page that all are sort of a lifestyle bundle. And, you know, that they, you know, and then that's, they didn't, they didn't, mostly go into video actually interestingly which is very expensive and distracting for other publishers um and they have this incredibly successful podcast business though that feels very again in sync with their brand i mean i think you know it's very impressive and and it actually to me at least does show a little the you know i mean that it was because they were under so much pressure that they were able to figure it out mm, yeah. um, I'm gonna, but I'm also gonna i think they got that. lucky i mean they got lucky and had good management and could easily have screwed things up more and made, good that, made worse choices. Yeah, good management, got lucky. Great brand too. Just can't deny it. Yeah. You know, it's oh, for sure. fantastic. Yeah. The thing is, I'm gonna own Sagar's slight slight of me as the Austin tech bro by just kind of asking you something that the tech bros are are, are really obsessed with. So um Biology Srinivasa and had him on the podcast, like Mark Andreessen had a lot of these guys on the podcast, and they frequently will attack the New York Times as this like family enterprise it's hereditary it's it's the opposite it's nepotistic it's the opposite of like the the desired framework of tech which is meritocratic and like this 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 or that but reading your book i'm sort of like wow it really seems like this quasi like monarchical system was actually the perfect way to weather media change versus like private equity or versus like vc money like this this or that like how does this make you think about like media ownership structure yeah, I mean, Jonah and I used to joke about like about how the notion that you you want to find the most qualified. It's like we've done a global search for the most qualified executive in the world, and and it's my son. Um, you know, like obviously that feels like it doesn't make sense, but I mean, news is a funny business, and like it is not always the absolute highest return on investment business. And have and it's interesting, like these those tech companies often talk about having values. But really, like they're commercial enterprises and the values yeah. follow from that. These family businesses, I mean, for better and for worse, I would say, like the Salzburgers really know who they are. They lose their footing sometimes, but they have a sense of what they want the New York Times to be. And it's not just a commercially profitable enterprise. And it kind of allowed them to keep their feet and their brand through this moment of change. I'm not sure it's always... I'm not sure it's always the best ownership structure, but I mean, I most think of them do. Yeah, because most of these family businesses have obviously yeah. failed. So yeah, like and, and the... so, I, so I'm not sure. I think they did a good job in this case, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, no. I mean, I think the sort of, I mean, I think you the tech industry probably because I do think that often got negative coverage they didn't like, and sometimes it was very stupid the the coverage, and they were right to be mad about it, and other times it was accurate and fair, and they just didn't like it. And but they developed this huge superstructure of ideology around what the media was doing that in some ways reflected the media's beliefs about the tech industry. Like mm. this, these tech entrepreneurs are mostly entrepreneurs who are trying to make money and build businesses. And partly I think, cause they talk so much about changing the world and like to talk like political figures and visionaries, the media, which is much more interested in politics and in society than in business covered them 
like took them at their word maybe and covered oh. them like they were political actors, but that's not really right. what they spend their time thinking about. Right. And I do think it led to a bunch of really bad coverage. And I do think, but they definitely responded by developing a theory of what medium was motivated by and how it worked that you are seeing play out really hilariously on Twitter right now. Like the way in which like the Twitter, like the Elon Musk, like had a genuinely like developed theory of what motivates journalists and media that involved these blue marks that like just was not accurate. You could have talked to any junior editor at the New York Times and been like, oh, yeah. Thank you for saying it this way because, like, once again, like, we work in tech, we're also in media. It's just sort of like, guys, this is like David Sachs had some insane Twitter threads where I'm like, dude, like, yeah, but it's like you've thought about, but it's also like, it's why you guys are smart and have thought about this a lot, but haven't really talked to anyone to test this theory. Like, it just, yeah, it's plausible, but it is not, it's not. Well, sort of the, with, the, well, the media business is screwed up in all sorts of ways, but not particularly the ways that they thought it was. It was sort of interesting. With to respect say. to some of them, Ben, they did talk to us, and we were like, "That's fucking stupid," and they just didn't listen. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, funny. and I was like, "Listen, man, I al- I align with you guys on a lot," and I'm like, "But that is just literally not how it works," because I used to work in it. But you know, you do whatever you want. Go ahead and charge for it, and see how it works out for you. Uh, this is an interesting question that you just referenced around business. Do you well, obviously Semaphore, uh, I, I, as I understand it, raise money in order to start? Do you think there is a venture scale opportunity again in media now that we are going towards the war niched out cover? So, niche can make you very, you can be very profitable, yeah. You could be, let's say, a hundred million dollar company, but is there a billion, is there a hundred billion dollar opportunity in media today? Um, you know, Politico sold recently for a billion dollars, Axios sold for like half a billion. Yeah. I don't think that's unreasonable. I mean, that's not a big company on the scale mm-hmm. of like Facebook, though. Right. And exactly. I think that the co- venture investors who would like, who want to invest ten million dollars and think that maybe in four or five years they're going to get ten or a hundred billion out, the media is not a good place for that money to go. Yes. And they're going to and and we didn't raise any any venture capital. We raised from, mm-hmm. you know, like I think smart business people who think that we can build a strong high margin healthy business that does good journalism but i don't but not anybody who thinks that in four years they're going to get a crazy return and i think i think that was a mistake you that's just probably got a good at- thing i think it's a good reversion to the mean like i was just reading uh william randolph Hearst's biography and yeah a lot of the people who were involved in media in the early 1900s they nobody was doing it to become filthy rich they understood they- it did oh, by the they way. did become filthy rich like if you had invested end. in Hearst but, yeah. early on you'd be okay and in fact i do think there's this and people also just forget what a great business newspapers were in the oh, 20th yeah. century yeah. i mean Monopoly. it's complicated <laughs> yeah yeah it was fascinating to watch it from go from not that great to really great and then the, all those people who did invest for the power purposes also got very very rich anyway Wait, quick quick that. quick comment and then uh yeah. basically my near last question um it's just interesting though because Ben, when you're articulating the, this isn't like a venture scale opportunity point, um, you're getting at why the word traffic was so important because the promise of traffic is that traffic meant scale. Scale meant this is similar to the exponential growth that a tech company could really offer. So like the, the, this, 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 this conceptualization of like, you, of you having these social platforms that are akin to cable companies is just really key. Like unpacking the fact that that wasn't actually a rhyme. Um, was really key. Um, really fascinating anecdote that I loved. The story, the book has lots of good stories, but the story I loved when you met with Steve Bannon. And Steve Bannon asked you like a very like interesting, like kind of good faith question, which is if Steve Bannon is capable of such a thing, which is, you know, I respect, you know, Jonah Peretti, game, you know, recognizes game. Breitbart is built off of Trump. Why is BuzzFeed and BuzzFeed News going all in on Bernie Sanders. So to help our tech listeners understand how this actually works, because if you guys were purely driven by clicks, you would have become Bernieville 2K16. It's very clear. It's very, very, very apparent. Um, and then to to the point of the Huffington Post history, the Huffington Post was kind of built on Obama's success too. So there, there, there was periods where sometimes like digital media and like the you know, like you know, an insurgent candidate like rhymed. Talk us through how you guys responded to Bernie in 2016. Yeah, and I mean, and this is probably me and my own journalistic points of view more than anybody else. But I, my, you know, the kind of journalism we were doing was independent and, you know, challenge, wanted to challenge power and 
break news and be and kind of without fear or favor and not just, and, you know, obviously we wanted to write stories everybody would read, but there was a kind of story you would read, which was like, well, this powerful person is awesome, yeah, that's right. which is it, about Bernie or about Trump. And that wasn't the kind of journalism we were coming out of. And, and it was certain, and, and I don't know if it was a commercial mistake because I don't think the ad advertisers particularly wanted yeah. that, but <laughs> certainly if you're, if, 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 but I don't, that was that was though that was not how I was thinking about it. But it was certainly if you wanted to get scale and build audience, you know, Bernie was as obvious as Trump in that way. And 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 I think for kind of populist politics, following the traffic is sort of a literal kind of populism. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I remember uh, working at the Daily Caller at the time and seeing the early surge for Trump. And looking at the coverage, and I remember being like, man, they have no idea like what is actually Oh, you know, that seats. was something Catherine yeah. Miller and I got access to this Facebook data for a time. And I write about it in the book in yeah. 2015 when they they wanted to do some little demonstration project of how smart they were basically and they could and how they could track which candidate was popping in which state. And like month after the first couple months, like every week, it's like Donald Trump in every state. No one's talking about anyone else. Yes. And then like was... and then and then for some reason the data stopped being available. Well, well but here's a <laughs> follow-up though. What's the limit of that? Because, because so at what point does traffic like not matter? Because Obama's an interesting story. Because in Obama 2007, HuffPost is like getting a good Obama traffic, but Obama was a online candidate and he was an in-person candidate. Marianne Williamson is crushing it on TikTok, but mm -hmm. like let's not pretend that actually translates. So like when does traffic? I'm asking political reporter Ben this. When does traffic like actually matter? Do you think, in a political sense? Yeah, I mean, I think I think when people encounter this person and say, I like watching their videos and I want them to be president of the United States. And I think yeah, those are just different formula. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, I mean, Andrew, Andrew Yang was another who a lot of people said, I like this guy, I like his ideas, but voters aren't idiots. I mean, yep. like they want someone who they can really see as having, as being president. I think that's a great point. Ben, uh, we'll wrap it there. I know you got to go. Uh, we really appreciate you joining Actually, us. Actually, one more thing, because you have two oh, minutes. Um, just uh, advice for anyone getting into journalism today. Like knowing no, this story, one. knowing this conversation, what would you yeah, say to a 23 year old? I have the same, I was the same as just go break some news. Like, like the thing that, that, that works across platform and in whatever ecosystem is getting new information that nobody else has and putting it on the internet. Should you be an there independent creator or should you go to a publication? Cause that's, cause that's the question uh, we actually get asked the most. We get I, this I, th I think it's, I think for yeah. the kind of journalism that I guess I came up in beat reporting, hard news reporting, it's hard to do as an independent creator. You do need, it, and a newsroom is really, really valuable. Not impossible. You can start a newsletter that covers a local place and break lots of news and and and, and have some import. But there's a level of legal protection of of kind of brand cover that it's very valuable. And, and of and of like particularly when you're young, a community of people who are teaching you how to do it that's pretty valuable. And so, very, very yeah, true. get get scoops and do it. I and find other people who like them. <laughs> I tell people that all the time. Ben, thank you so much for joining us, man.